دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله إن الحمد لله رب العالمين هو الذي جعل المسلمين This is Yusuf Estes and for the next little bit we're going to be talking on the subject of our new series Lifting the Fog Dealing with the misconceptions misunderstandings, and falsehoods attributed to Islam. We want to begin by mentioning that the way the Muslims should respond to these accusations, insinuations, is always from the perspective of what the Qur'an and the teachings of Muhammad have shown us. The methodology or the manhaj of Islam dictates for us that we must, as Muslims, always present ourselves and the answers in the best possible light and remove these misconceptions. As a matter of fact, being a person who came to Islam myself, I have to understand that there is a mentality out there that people are afraid of what they don't understand. After all, I've been there myself. In fact, I remember thinking in the old days before coming to Islam, oh, what about these people? What, what are they? Who are they? Where are they coming from? What's this religion about? So, when we see these interrogations coming toward us, interrogatories, that are really harsh, that are difficult and insulting. It's re- important for us to always recall that the Prophet, peace be upon him, experienced this and more, much more than this. So for us, it's not that complicated. It's very simple. We go back to the way that Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, dealt with these same things. But for us in the English language, we can do it real simple with these simple tactics person comes to you, and I'm going to give you an example. They say, oh, are you one of those Muslims? Well, we heard you Muslims have four wives. We want to know how come that a man can have four wives. Why can't the woman have four husbands? Now, that's a pretty good question. And if you think about it, how would we answer that? If you start to try to explain the Quran says this and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that and this time is different than those times back in those days and here we are in this millennium, etc., etc. You're going to, first of all, you're going to make a mistake because you're not going to give the right answer. Second of all, it doesn't sound like you know what you're talking about. You're going to confuse the people and make the situation even worse. You'll be frustrated and they'll be confused and that's obviously not what we're after. So, what do I say? How do I handle it? Regardless of what the question might be, our response needs to come the same way every time and be consistent. person comes to you in a harsh, attacking manner, your response should always be, thank you for asking me about my religion. They're going to go, huh? <laughs> They're not ready for that. Especially when they came to you with such a harsh statement contained in their question. That's why we usually tell them that the best thing for us to do is to begin by remembering that they really don't know. And they're confused. They've heard people say things. So they have the right to know the truth about what is Islam. And what Islam is saying about these particular situations or questions that they're bringing up. So we begin by telling them that Islam is based on truth. We have to tell the truth or we can go to hell. So that's very serious for us. The second thing is that Islam is having the proof. Everything is documented and preserved and authenticated for over 1400 years. So this is not something that's going to be a difficult problem for us to solve. The third thing I like to tell them is that a lot of times questions are not really questions as much as they are statements. But they have a question mark at the end of it. And sometimes you can't really give a simple answer to a question that has a statement in it if the statement is incorrect. Let's give an example of a question that has a statement in it that's incorrect. Someone comes to you and says, can you answer for me a question with a yes or no answer? You go, okay. Then they say, is your mother out of jail yet? What kind of question is this? My mother's never been in jail. No, you said you could answer yes or no. We just want yes or no. But she's never been... Ah, ah. Yes or no? How can I answer such a question as this? Because if I say, well, she's not in jail, therefore she's out of jail, so I'll say, yes, she's out, then they're going to say what? They're going to say, oh, I'm glad she got out. But she's never been in jail. 
And if I say, well, no, meaning that no, she's never been in jail, then where would I be with that? Because the situation now, I'm be saying that, in fact, she's still in jail. And neither one of these are correct answers, but I can't give a correct answer because the question has a statement which is false. And so how can I deal with that? First thing is to take the question and straighten it out and say, do you mean by your question, has my other mother ever been in jail? The answer, of course, would be no. And that would be the best way to deal with that question. So as we begin to give them the answer to the question by straightening it out, the next thing we want to say to them is, by the way, have you considered that if you hear something in this statement, that when we begin to give you the answers, you hear something you like, and you said, gee, this is nice. This is something I like it for me. And if you heard that in the answer to your question, would you be prepared at that stage to reconsider your life and see what you're doing and then consider worshiping your Lord and your God alone without any partners? Because, you see, this is what Islam is really all about. Now, at that stage, they're going to go, what? Because the answer to your question actually shows you why there really is a God. And it shows you why there can only be one God. And it shows you why you have to worship Him without partners. But based on what I just said, would you like to hear the answer? What do you think they're going to say? <laughs> of course, they want to know the answer now. Now we'll come back to that particular question. Why can a man have four wives and a woman cannot have four husbands? Well, first of all, the way they ask the questions, there are different forms of the same question. They say, why does Islam say you have to have four wives? And, of course, on that one, it doesn't say you have to have four wives. And when it comes to the number of wives and the number of husbands, this is something that you have to understand and explain a little bit. So it means you're going to have to have a couple of minutes to sit here and talk about it. First and foremost, though, is to understand that Islam is about what? It's about marriage. Because in marriage, you have a contract. And in a contract, people have rights. So now we get to come to the biggest subject of all. Islam is about rights. About rights. But it has a balance. And the balance is the limits. You have a right. You have a right to have a mate. Someone to be with intimately. Someone to love and care for you. Someone to be compassionate with and someone to share your life with. That's your right. But there's limits. And this is why Islam is coming from Allah, not from us. It's not a man-made religion. It's not something that I made up or that you can make up or even that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, made up. It is from Allah. Let's understand something. When we begin to talk about the marriage and the idea in Islam of having more than one spouse. That word actually is not polygamy. Polygamy is a word in English which means to have more than one spouse without limit. Okay? It can be a number of husbands or wives. Okay? The word we're looking for in English is polygyny, which means that a man is able to have more than one spouse, but not the woman. Now, if you said, well, that's... Uh, that's limiting, and why is that, and how come it's not fair? Again, I remember to mention to you, remind you, that Islam is talking about what's right and righteous, not about what human beings consider to be fair. And when the verse comes that talks about this subject in the Quran, it comes in a very important verse dealing with some other rights, the rights of the yatim or the orphans. This is called Surah An-Nisa, which is the chapter about the women. It begins by telling us not to do something that was the custom of the time, which was to marry little orphan girls in order to inherit their wealth. So that if a child's parents died, some tribal leader could come along and say, well, I'm going to marry this girl. And she's only two years old or four years old. I'm going to marry her. I'm going to take her wealth. And I have the right because they treated women worse than animals, and if they married them, they treated them less than their uh, sheep or goats. So women really didn't have rights back then. So when Islam is coming now, it's saying, first of all, the rights of the orphans, the rights of these little children to have their wealth, tells us that we can't take their wealth and mingle it with our own, hoping to increase our own position. So this is something that we begin with, mentioning that. And read the verse to them, because it does start out by saying... 
and, and any time a verse starts with the word and, it's only fair that we should look at the verse before it to see what is the continuum of the ayah or the verse. Okay? Because it is dealing with the subject here of how we treat orphans and their wealth. And it's saying for sure that you cannot marry these girls and take their wealth away from them. Rather, you should marry other women of your choice. And then it continues by saying, Ithnin, which is two, Thalat, which is three, Arba, which is four. And it says, if you can treat them with equality, otherwise you can marry only one. Well, actually there are limits now which are being set forth in this ayah. The limit, first of all, is that you can only marry two or three or four, provided that you will treat them with equality. Otherwise, you can only marry one. The first limit is the number. Because prior to Islam coming, there was no limit whatsoever on how many wives you could have. The men of those days had many wives. Some of them had so many they couldn't count them. Maybe more wives than they had sheep or goats. So the first thing that happened for the Muslims was not that they ran out and said, Oh, wow, we can get a bunch of wives. It was the opposite. They said, Oh, dear. We have to divorce wives that we have. The number must be four or less, and I can only keep wives that I can treat with equality. Of course, this is talking about financial more so than anything else. You have to treat them in such a way that each has the same type of house, clothing, transportation, food, etc. It's not permissible in Islam to favor one over the other in these areas. So, obviously, it's going to be very difficult for anybody to have more than one wife. But what is the real limit that we're talking about here? The real limit here is one that's even bigger than that. And when we understand this and present it in the correct way, this then will be what's called the hikmah of Islam, the wisdom in Islam. And it's why so many people, really, when they come to understand the answers to these questions... Not only do they comply and say, this is nice, thank you very much, many of them will enter into Islam. And we want to break this down and give you the parts to it so that you can understand it better, so that you can deal with these questions yourself. We'll be back after this, and I want you to think about what we said and see how you would have responded to this same question. Why can a man have four wives and a woman can only have one husband? We'll be back after this and then we'll discuss it more. Bismillah, we're back. We've been talking on the subject of lifting the fog, dealing with the misconceptions, misunderstandings about what is Islam and who are the Muslims. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. We've been breaking down one particular subject, and we'd like to treat each one, one by one, through this series. But always we're going to come back with the same initial intent, and that is to present Islam correctly and at the same time encourage the people to understand what is Islam, who is Allah, and what's our responsibility, our purpose in life. The question we were talking about in this case is the one about why can a man have four wives, but a woman can only have one husband. We broke it down in the beginning by saying that the first thing to start with is saying, thank you for asking me about my religion. This does two things. One, it changes the tone of the whole thing from being one of animosity toward one of being a little bit more subtle and a little bit more pleasant. The second thing that it does, it gives us a chance to present it as a real answer to a real question. We begin then by mentioning Islam as the truth, and we must say the truth, or else we'll be held accountable on the Day of Judgment for it. So we're not going to lie. The other thing is that we have the authentic, preserved answers to all of these questions in the Quran and in the teachings of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. So it's already there. When we come to the Quran,